Testosterone is a very important hormone for both men and women. And we know that levels, especially in men, have been declining over the last 50 years or so. And that's a huge issue. You have more and more young men uh, these days going to uh, clinics to get testosterone replacement therapy. And I think it's a bit uh, misguided. I think um, sometimes, of course, this is justified if someone really needs it. But I think a lot of times we can do things to optimize our, our testosterone levels before going to that step. And especially in younger men, I think that's something that needs to be evaluated. But then again, also women do supplement sometimes with testosterone um, because women do also benefit from having normal testosterone levels. But I want to talk a bit about, you know, other things we can do before jumping to supplementation by taking it as an injection or as a, as a gel, like this androgel. What else can be done to optimize these levels and what's the reason why they are low? So again, over the last 50 years, they've really declined. And one reason I talked to in about another video about is uh, increased exposure to plastics. So we know that these um, phthalates and bisphenols, they're right down here, um, are actually hormone disruptors. And they can certainly um, have an impact on that. They can have an impact on testosterone as well, on estrogen and testosterone. Um, another thing is, you know, poor sleep. So there's certain patterns that we've changed. Nutrition-wise, we've cut out fat. So we went on this, you know, in the 80s, this was... 70s, 80s, we started this low-fat uh, craze, which turned out, you know, was a bit misguided, you know. We do need good fats, we do need cholesterol, because that's the backbone of these hormones. But I'm going to jump into it a bit. So, uh, to understand testosterone, and again, there's many videos about this, but I think it's important to just realize this. So, we have a total testosterone and a free testosterone. So, the total testosterone, and there are some levels here that our lab does, um, 241 to 827 nanograms per deciliter, then the free testosterone is only about 2% of the total. So that's between 46 to 224. And that's the important one. And why is that important? So most of your testosterone, 98%, is bound to proteins. Most of it is bound to sex hormone binding globulin. That's kind of a weird thing. SHBG is the abbreviation for that. Sex hormone binding globulin. And these are also levels that we can measure. And I'm going to talk about why that's important as well. And part of it is bound to albumin. But for practical purposes, once testosterone is bound to protein, it can't be used. The testosterone that does the work in the body where we need it. And we're mostly talking about skeletal muscle today, that there's other tissues where testosterone is active as well. But for simplicity, we're focusing on that. So it's only the free portion of the testosterone that we can use. The rest of it is really bound and for practical purposes, we can't, we can't use it. So again, when we think about that, now if you replace testosterone, you're replacing uh, and you're increasing total testosterone. Whenever you change a hormone in one axis by giving more of it, other axes are affected. There are consequences to this. So instead of jumping to just saying, hey, you know what I mean? If I just keep pumping in more testosterone, more total testosterone, even if some of it binds again, uh, my free testosterone will go up. And that's true, but it does have other consequences. So Instead of focusing on that, let's look at what can we do to have more free testosterone, because that's really the more important part, because that's the testosterone that we can use, and we can heavily influence that. So, one thing is high-intensity weightlifting, and there are plenty of studies on that. I'm going to link some studies to this, um, uh, talk about this. So, meaning frequently working out more than three times a week. We're talking about four, five, six, uh, even seven times a week. You know, you can split up muscle groups, but heavy lifting... And when we talk about heavy lifting, it's not, you know, don't injure yourself, but basically go to the point of real muscle fatigue, you know, and that's really crucial. And I, I know when I, was, when I was younger, when I worked out, my intensity was much higher. You know, I had more energy, you know, and I just had more drive to do it. And so as, I'm, as I've become older, I mean, I've become a bit more complacent about it. And lately, I've, you know, pushed myself more again because it's important to realize when you're lifting, you know, you can have one person lift, you know, kind of, you know, half ass and not have great results. And then, you know, if that person is more motivated, they work out with a trainer or, you know, a training partner that kind of motivates them, they get better results. And uh, it's really in the effort that we put in, you know, don't stop at rep number 10. If you can keep going, keep going, and then slightly increase the weight. Always keep it safe. Don't injure yourself, of course. But the intensity is key. Uh, also, larger muscle groups, of course, you will have more response. And you will see testosterone will spike after that. It's transient. It's a short spike, but it's an important one that we can utilize. Um, dietary protein saturated fats. So if we take in a diet that's too low in dietary protein and in saturated fat, and that's actually very important. So saturated fat is important because essentially, you know, cholesterol fats are the backbone to building uh, cholesterol. That's the building block. Without it, we can't make it. 
And again, I talked about these low fat diets. And I think part of the reason why over these last 50, 60 years, testosterone has plummeted so much, everything is low fat. And we know for a while now that this was misguided. Cholesterol was misunderstood. I did a video about that. You don't have to be afraid of saturated fat, you know, have good fats. I always talk about the fats um, for cooking that I recommend. And I know that I'm sounding like a broken record probably about this, but it's butter. You have um, avocado oil, coconut oil, and olive oil, and those are very good. And then of course, things like, like eggs, like whole eggs, you know, they have very good fats and these are all building blocks for uh, hormones, for testosterone that are very much necessary for proper functioning. So it's very important. Also good proteins. The one thing to remember is cut out the things like soy protein. So soy protein is, is very bad, it's very estrogenic. And when we think of healthy, estro, uh, sorry, healthy testosterone levels, uh, soy does get in the way because it's very estrogenic. So I would not recommend any, any soy protein consumption. When it comes to supplementation, you know, I mean, most of the uh, protein should come from good sources. If you're not vegetarian or, or vegan, then meats are certainly a very good source. You know, red meat, uh, chicken, fish is good. Uh, for vegetarians, eggs are absolutely very good, you know. And then even in some milk products, more on the yogurts, I don't like uh, regular milk because of the high uh, lactose in there, but some milk products are fine, you know. Um, for vegans, you know, again, there are some pea protein is certainly a protein that, that can be used and it should replace soy protein. This is a much better choice. Sleep. Many studies have shown that sleep, um, ideally eight hours a night of good sleep. I know that sounds a bit unrealistic. I would say I probably get about seven hours of sleep, then, you know, of, of good sleep. Um, but sleep is hugely important. For each hour of sleep under eight hours, there's a rough guideline. You may lose 10 to 15% of your testosterone. It's that impactful. So sleep is crucial. And, you know, that's one of the things too, when we think about over the last 50, 60 years, arguably, um, stress levels are up, you know, uh, we work more, we have less rest and we don't take care of ourselves very well. So, but I think sleep is something that is very um, underutilized to optimize our testosterone levels. So try to get really good sleep. It's very important. Um, and, you know, it doesn't always have to be perfect, but, you know, seven, eight hours is a good, good guy. Um, body fat, oh, sorry, alcohol ties in with sleep. So um, alcohol, unfortunately, uh, lowers testosterone, also disrupts your sleep because most people have to get up in the middle of the night, go to the bathroom, all these kind of things. So alcohol, unfortunately, no matter how you slice it, it's not great. I used to have a drink every night. I changed that a few years ago. I only drink on the weekends now, you know, uh, many people don't drink at all. I mean, that's great, but I think to be realistic, you know, if you go out to dinner or you have a drink on the weekend, I think that should be absolutely fine. But I really would keep it in, in moderation. Alcohol doesn't do any favors. I know sometimes socially this is important as well. And I'm a strong believer if you are too strict and cutting everything out, you're probably not going to stick to it. So I would say realistically two, three glasses a week should be fine. Um, but again, the less the better. Um, body fat. That's a very interesting one. The more body fat we have, especially visceral fat, the lower the testosterone and especially for men, the higher the estrogen goes. So it's a, a, we know that uh, body fat, uh, also for women, uh, having too much body fat, we have hormonal issues. We think of polycystic ovarian disease, which is really related to excess body fat. And as the body fat comes down, uh, hormones regulate. So for men, having a lower body fat will definitely increase your testosterone and lower estrogen. So it's gonna shift that hormonal axis in the right pattern. And that's a very important one. Um, and I wanna bring this up briefly, when I talked about high intensity weightlifting, I mean, not only does it increase total and thereby a fraction of the free testosterone, um, it does decrease the sex hormone binding globulin that I mentioned. And that is again, this hormone that makes it unusable. So we're lowering sex hormone binding uh, globulin, which is very important. And therefore we have much more free testosterone, which is really what we want, because we don't care so much about the total number, we care about the free testosterone. And also that's the one thing that upregulates your androgen receptor density. Androgen receptor density is a uh, huge important. And that's something, you know, again, when you have this uh, testosterone, it can only link to certain receptors on certain cells to trigger its response. And if we don't have enough of these receptors, it's not gonna do anything. So there's very, very few things that can upregulate androgen receptor density. You know, but the weightlifting that I mentioned, you know, the intense weightlifting is one of the things that can significantly upregulate androgen receptor density. It's a very important one. So we can't um, always rely on, you know, a pill or a shot or anything like that. 
you know, sometimes we have to put some hard work in to get excellent results from that. Right? And then myostatin is another component I want to mention briefly. So myostatin is an interesting one. So these are all influencing our hormonal axis when it comes to testosterone. Now myostatin is something that your, your body secretes when it thinks you have too much muscle. And you think of bodybuilders having a lot of muscle. That is something where your body says, you know, this is not very good for me for several reasons, you know, um, you know, uh, metabolically and then blood pressure and all these kind of things can become issues when people have too much muscle. So the body then secretes myostatin and myostatin is really difficult to bring down. Uh, but again, one thing that can bring myostatin down is high intensity weight training and uh, dietary protein saturated fat can bring it down as well. So these are the two things, right? Okay, so um, on sleep, we're going to upregulate total testosterone and free testosterone to some extent. Um, and again, also sleep can bring down, very importantly, sex hormone binding globulin, which is what we want. Because this is the main hormone that binds testosterone to make it unusable. And alcohol, unfortunately, does the opposite. It increases sex hormone binding globulin. And that's an interesting one. So when we think of um, things that damage the liver, such as alcohol or simply getting older, you know, the older we get, the liver over time accumulates damage, especially when we had a lifestyle that wasn't very, you know, good for our liver. The liver, as it becomes worse, makes more sex hormone binding globulin, the hormone we don't want. So as you, um, you know, do bad things for your liver, the liver kind of has this revenge thing of just, you know, increasing your sex hormone binding globulin and decreasing your testosterone, which is not good, right? So it's very important to remember this, that alcohol can certainly do that. Um, and we got to be a bit careful with that. And sleep, um, you know, again, can bring it down, which is what we want. We want less of this. And then alcohol can bring it up, unfortunately. If you decrease your body fat, as I mentioned before, total testosterone, pre testosterone goes up and also sex hormone globulin goes down. So this is a very important one, right? Just simply by, you know, bringing your body fat down. Now, let's talk about some uh, nutrients. Uh, zinc has been studied. Zinc is, is very important. Um, we know zinc is important when we think of viral illnesses. Um, it's good, good for the immune response. But also, it has an, a high impact on testosterone, and that's a very interesting one. So zinc can increase total testosterone, free testosterone, and it can also decrease sex hormone binding globulin. And that's actually very important. Um, we think of many minerals, such as zinc, and I'm going to mention boron later, and these minerals or trace minerals are less available in our nutrition. And the reason is over farming, you know, and, and processing foods has decreased the uh, amount of some of these minerals. So um, taking small amounts of zinc might be helpful. Always, again, this is not medical advice. Talk to your doctor. Um, you might have a condition where you should not. But if you're okay with it, somewhere between 20 and 30 milligrams a day, um, is something that can be helpful for healthy testosterone levels. Zinc is not really stored very well, so we kind of have to take it daily. Um, vitamin D. So vitamin D is also um, a bit more of a hormone. Um, it acts as a, as a hormone rather than a vitamin, uh, but we found that it's actually very important for uh, a testosterone. So it can increase testosterone levels, um, thereby increasing some of the uh, free testosterone. And interestingly, for vitamin D and zinc, both of them lower sex hormone binding globulin. I think that's the more important part of these. Yes, they can raise the total levels, but again, what's interesting for us is how can we decrease this protein that's binding the testosterone to make it unusable? And that is basically um, something that both zinc and vitamin D can do. So they can both lower sex hormone binding globulin. So that's very important. Next point is a bit sensitive. So statins. Um, so statins are medications used to lower LDL cholesterol. I am not a huge fan of statins. I think they have a, they have a proper use in, in medicine. They can be cardioprotective. So if someone just had a heart attack, you know, or at a very high risk of a heart attack, there's a family history and all that. Statins have been shown to be protective to the heart. So that's true. But just giving statins when someone's total cholesterol is slightly elevated, in my opinion, is a mistake. Um, again, it's a bit misguided. We always thought that, oh, well, just by all means, we need to lower LDR cholesterol. And I did a talk about cholesterol. This might be something that you want to uh, look at. But LDL is not, is not bad. You know, it's been made out to be bad, but that's not quite the case. It only becomes bad when it becomes oxidized. How does LDL become oxidized? It's if it's in the presence of too much uh, sugar, too much carbohydrates. So when I look at a cholesterol, if someone has a um, very low triglycerides, high HDL, then I'm almost, you know, uh, I almost 
feel it's very, very secondary or not as important to me what the LDL is. Um, and, that, and the reason is that, again, if your triglycerides are on the very low side and your HDL is very high, that's very protective. And also shows that your uh, uh, carbohydrate consumption is on the lower side. And then the LDL doesn't have much of a risk of oxidizing. I usually look at the hemoglobin A1C as well, just to see where the blood sugars are running over a period of about three months. And that gives me a better idea about it. But again, uh, someone comes in with a cholesterol of I don't know, 240, 250, if they have low triglycerides and high HDL, I would probably not put them on a statin because here's the risk. So you need LDL cholesterol. And the LDL cholesterol, again, if it's not oxidized, is very functional. It's needed for the neurons in the brain. So that's a very important one. It's needed for hormone synthesis, especially for testosterone. So you do need that LDL cholesterol. And LDL cholesterol is basically just like a, like a bus that carries around the cholesterol. But the cholesterol is very much needed in healthy cell membrane functioning. Um, lowering it with a statin brings with it issue. One issue is it definitely lowers your testosterone, right? And many men that are, uh, you know, on a, on a statin will also be on a testosterone replacement therapy. So again, it's from a business side of medicine, yes, you're becoming a great client because usually you, these are being given for the rest of your life. So, but the question is, do you really need them? And always, you know, never stop a medication or start a medication on your own. You always have to talk to your primary care doctor or your cardiologist, but maybe that's a discussion worth having, you know? And if you have better parameters, we're saying, you know, I really just significantly lowered my carbohydrate intake. I have a very low triglyceride count and my, um, you know, HDL is high. Maybe you can evaluate together with your doctor if you can get off the statin. That might be something that you can do together with your doctor. All right, uh, boron. So uh, boron is another metal or, 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 or trace mineral that's very important. Um, Studies have shown that taking boron can definitely increase uh, uh, your testosterone. It's a very interesting one. And also, most significantly, boron will, is the one that mostly can impact the sex hormone binding regime. So this is one supplement that I like. However, there are some risks to this one. And um, most studies were done at about 10 milligrams of, of boron daily. Um, if you take it for too long, it can accumulate and there is a risk of toxicity. So most uh, physicians will say, after you've been on it for three weeks, take at least one week off. And that's kind of the schedule that people recommend. Um, you don't wanna go uh, over about 12 milligrams a day. And remember, you get some in with your diet as well. It's for example, an avocado and some other greens. Um, but again, what we get in these days is lower because there's less in the soil. I mean, you know, there's something that's very depleted. So I think it's fair to say it's fair to try to supplement with boron, but keeping in mind that there are risks. And again, don't start without checking with your doctor. This is not medical advice. Um, you may you know, have a condition where you should not supplement with boron. So these are always good questions to ask your primary care doctor, but it's an interesting one. And I think it can be helpful. L-carnitine. Now, L-carnitine is interesting. Um, L-carnitine can uh, really, really increase androgen receptor density. However, there's a caveat to that. You need a lot of it. And um, again, why is it important to have more androgen receptor density? Well, because again, even the portion of free testosterone that you have in order for that to work, you need more of these receptors where it clings to. And we're talking mostly about skeletal muscle right now. And you can increase that. However, you need to take a lot of it. And then my concern is, I don't know, taking that much of it over longer periods of time I would assume there could be more adverse reactions to this. And it's also you know, costly and um, there is a way to do it. You can inject it. These are all questions for your doctor. I personally wouldn't take it. Um, not very interested in this because it's just the, the sheer quantity of it is kind of uh, a bit, you know, makes me feel a bit queasy about it. Okay. So again, the uh, testosterone replacement, testosterone replacement therapy. And again, there are many clinics who are really legit and who are doing this with the right parameters and the right goal in mind. And um, I think many uh, men can, uh, and, and women as well, um, can benefit from testosterone replacement therapy. Again, I think it's overdone and it's simplified. So if the reason is because your total testosterone, let's say is somewhere in the mid range, let's say around, let's say 400, uh, and you don't have symptoms, then I would not agree with just starting testosterone replacement therapy. 
And it shouldn't be just that, but there should be other parameter studies. For example, what's your free testosterone, right? What's your sex hormone binding globulin level? And I think there are a lot of steps that we just looked at here that you can do before jumping to replacement. But many clinics, it's like, you know, if you're a man over 40 and, you know, they take a total testosterone and even if you're mid-range, it'd be like, hey, <laughs> so I'm definitely way over 40. And if I walked in, my testosterone is around 500. So it's in the mid-range and I don't have any you know, symptoms of, of, of a low testosterone. But I guarantee you, if I walked in, they said, hey, yeah, that's 500. I think, you know, you qualify, but I will start you on it. And the reason why I'm hesitant about it is just replacing when you don't need it, you know, if you don't have any symptoms of it, um, of, of, of a low testosterone, uh, there are a lot of risks that, that, that are carried uh, with it, you know. Um, it is also a bit, you know, habit forming. I wouldn't say this is not really a uh, physical addiction, uh, but I'm assuming, because everybody, all my patients that are on testosterone when they start, they say, ah, oh, I felt really good, right? And it makes sense, right? When you have high testosterone levels, you know, you have more energy, you got this, got this drive. But um, again, it carries with it certain risks. But this feeling of feeling great on it is certainly something that, you know, I would say something probably an addictive thing. And that might not always be good. So just keep that in mind as well. Okay. So what are the risks of testosterone replacement therapy when, again, not, we're not talking about replacement when it's needed, but, you know, replacement when probably it wasn't needed or, you know, people are replacing because they want to build more muscle or yeah, they, they're going overboard, right? Um, so when it's needed and it's just replacing uh, what's not there, I think that there can be a benefit to that. But if you are, you know, taking it when you don't really need it and you're going a bit on the higher side, because it's hard to dose this, right? Um, also keep in mind, you know, usually it's given like once a week or once every two weeks. And I think that's also not quite right because that's not how your normal testosterone levels work. I mean, if someone does testosterone replacement therapy, it should be taken at least every two or three days, uh, not like once a week, because then you have these... Phew, real, you know, issues with the uh, blood levels. Okay, risks if you're taking too much or if it's not needed. Increased risk of myocardial infarction, increased blood pressure, erythrocytosis, which means you have more red blood cells. Sounds like a good thing. We always think of athletes training at, you know, high altitude. But uh, that can lead to increased clotting, can lead to other issues. And so uh, having more red blood cells uh, uh, that, that are produced due to testosterone is not a good thing. Um, polycythemia, which is similar to erythrocytosis. So polycythemia, especially you increasing the number of red blood cells and their size, that's kind of the only difference, but that might have another reason why that's there. And that's certainly something if someone has polycythemia that should be investigated uh, by the internist. Um, <clears throat> a drop in HDL, and that's important. Remember, HDL is very important. It's uh, protective, it's part of the cholesterol, it's very protective. And a uh, supplement with testosterone certainly will drop uh, uh, HDL. Um, hair loss. So uh, testosterone is converted by 5-alpha reductase to dihydrotestosterone or DHT and DHT can accumulate at the hair follicle causing hair loss. So certainly um, if we uh, increase the testosterone, uh, especially when it goes to the higher levels, um, there's much more DHT and the DHT can, if someone's predisposed to this, cause significant hair loss. That's why a lot of um, you know people that are on testosterone replacement, uh, a lot of men on testosterone replacement are also put on finasteride or Propecia, which is a 5-alpha reductase enzyme blocker. So again, that's another medication then that needs to be sometimes added on top of it. As I mentioned before, testosterone can make you feel very good and can give you more energy, but it can also cause agitation. And that is something to be taken very seriously. Um, how we react on higher levels of testosterone uh, can be very dangerous. And especially in relationships, um, you know, there can be situations where um, arguments escalate and so on. So this could be very detrimental um, and it's something that really needs to be taken very seriously. And people taking testosterone supplementation, I think, should be aware that this could happen and also really, you know, uh, bring this up to the primary care doctor if there's issues with this. It's something to be taken very seriously. Okay, uh, increase in body hair, uh, especially in men. So yes, that's something that'll happen. I mean, that's probably not such a such a major deal, especially when people take uh, testosterone supplementation in the form of androgel. Wherever the gel is applied on that skin, that certainly will have an uh, uh, increase in um, body hair, but also all in general, it can cause more uh, uh, body hair prevalence. Um, prostate cancer risk does go up. We know that testosterone is involved in that. Um, again, it's something that 
other medications can mitigate, um, but there is a higher risk of uh, prostate cancer with that. Gynecomastia is really if you stop the testosterone. And that's kind of the caveat also that I'm thinking about. When you take testosterone supplementation or testosterone replacement therapy, so especially in younger men, what we have to understand is whenever we um, supplement with this, our natural production goes down. So that means, you know, the hormonal axis are shifting. Um, also, while you're taking the testosterone, your estrogen will go up. And then when you suddenly stop the testosterone, you will have a disproportionately higher estrogen level. And that can cause certain issues. So I think the issue that we should think about, if you don't truly need it, um, why I would say ask questions first and explore other ways to optimize your free testosterone is once you're on it, uh, when you stop it, uh, you will actually be below the baseline where you started at least for a while. And um, again, that's something that needs to be explained to you before you, you know, start a, a replacement therapy. Again, if it's something where we say, look, this is certainly needed, then that's certainly something that uh, um, should possibly be done. But in many cases, I think we just uh, should optimize other factors first. Okay, and then as I mentioned before, another way that's important, cut out your um, plastics in contact with food. I did a video about that. So the um, phthalates and bisphenols, we think about BPA, but there's others as well. When it, when it says BPA free, then they have, you know, BPS, BPF, they have others in there. And all these are hormone disruptors and they can certainly decrease your testosterone levels. There's anecdotal data of people that doubled their testosterone by cutting out exposure to these plastics. That means not heating anything in plastic containers, not drinking out of plastic bottles, you know, using glass and stainless steel. Um, and really in general, uh, choosing foods that are not uh, significantly packaged in plastic, they can also make, uh, make a huge difference. So again, in summary, we're really interested in the free testosterone. I know that testosterone levels have been dropping over the last you know, 50, 60 years, but if we can uh, change some of these parameters, and I think these are uh, things that we can all address, uh, and then maybe do a blood panel that shows the free testosterone, not just the total, but also the free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, and then really make an educated decision, I think less people will be inclined to go or to jump straight to testosterone replacement therapy. Um, again, I hope this was helpful. These are some steps that I think can be done and some supplementation and uh, hopefully this helps.